Luke chapter three, verses one through six. Luke chapter three, verses one through six, let me read them to you. And now in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate being governor of Judea, Herod being tetrarch of Galilee, his brother Philip being tetrarch of Iturea in the region of Trachonitis, and Licinius tetrarch of Abilene, while Annas and Caiaphas were high priest, the word of God came to John, the son of Zacharias, in the wilderness. And he went into all the region around the Jordan, preaching a baptism of repentance for the remission of sins, as is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Every valley shall be filled, and every mountain and hill brought low. The crooked places shall be made straight, and the rough places smooth, and all flesh shall see the salvation of God. It is the issuing forth of God's message and God's messenger that comes to individuals at different point in time that actually makes that point in time important. It is the messengers of God and the chronicle of the messengers of God that God sends out that makes any age a high age or an important age. It's not powerful people and powerful men and the machinations of political power and effort and the war machines that men have constructed that is a reflection and the empires that men have built that ultimately is an expression or a picture or a portrait of what is important in any age. What's important in any age is the messengers that God sends to that age and as we indicated in the prayer that we prayed before our message. God's judgment on any age is when God is silenced. The dark of, darkness of any age, or that age that seems to be relatively irrelevant to history and the ongoing flow of God's purposes is in the age and that time in which God withholds his word and his voice from a people or a place. The thing that makes any kind of historical point important is it's the point where God speaks through an messenger. And so here you have in this passage, related to us, uh, seven notable men who all are needed to point to the precise hour when God spoke by a prophet named John. You have a emperor, you have a governor, you have two tetrarchs, you have two high priests, and all these individuals are simply marking the time and the place in which God sent forward his message by one person with a rather generic name by the name of John. And that's the important thing. That's the thing that God takes note of. And any place. So I oftentimes think of men who have been involved in ministry and church ministry and God has given them a place to speak to a congregation and they find some favor with the people and they find some leverage among people and they have some influence and they decide to parlay that influence and go into politics. And I, I, to me, it's always a demotion, a significant demotion from what God has done. It's the man who stands before people proclaiming the word of God who has wonderfully reached the high point of uh, what God is doing in any age at any point. And the low point in any age at any point is when God is silent. That's the idea. And so here we have this message of John. And John has come and God is, God is declaring and something important is going to happen. This is an important age. This is an important time for Israel. And John comes with a message and we have relayed to us what his message is all about. His message is the introduction of a king that's coming. He says, prepare the way of the Lord. God himself is coming to reign as king. Prepare the way of the Lord. And there's a declaration that God is bringing with him salvation to all people. This is not simply a kingdom for the Jewish people. This is a kingdom for all people. All flesh shall see the salvation of God. This is ultimately a declaration, as we know now, of the coming of Jesus Christ. Because he is the coming king. And he is the coming savior. He is the embodiment of the kingdom. He brings the kingdom of God near because he's the king himself. He brings salvation near because he is salvation himself. He provides it for all individuals and he'll provide it as he goes to the cross and dies for their sin and rises again from the grave. And he applies that salvation to all who will turn to him in faith. And it's this turning to him in faith that becomes the application and the primary point of John's message and what we're going to consider this morning. This turning in faith that's 
given to us in this wonderful word picture in this text. We're, we're told that John came calling for or delivering to the people a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. That is that John was calling those in the age in which he spoke that they were to turn from their sins and they were to look to the coming king and savior in order that they might, they might receive forgiveness and cleansing from the, him and their baptism was to be expression of this deep desire and longing in them to be made clean and made right for the coming of this king. And we have a bit of a conundrum when we consider this passage and we consider the words of John. Some individuals think that John's word was only spoken just briefly for people that had an opportunity to embrace the Messiah that was coming in Jesus Christ, but that it was not, it's not a gospel message because John's message was repent and believe. And there are some that teach that there's nothing that is required for us to find salvation from Jesus Christ, but simply to believe. Repentance doesn't have to be a part of it, just faith has to be a part of it. And they'll quote things, uh, verses like, the just shall live by faith, or that uh, for by grace have you been saved through faith, or if we confess with our mouths and believe in our heart that Jesus Christ is the Lord, we shall be saved. And you see there, it's just faith, and there's nothing about repentance there, but they have to ignore that John's message was a message of repent and believe, and that the Lord Jesus came after John, and we're told that Jesus' message that he preached throughout Israel was repent and believe, and that when he assigned a message to his disciples, and they went out two by two, their message was repent and believe, and that even when John, Peter and Paul later described the essence of their message, when they describe it in the epistles, it was a, a message of repentance of sins and faith towards God, of repent and believe, and I think there's an answer to this problem, this idea that, well, we just need faith and we don't need to repent. And I, I think we can solve this problem by pointing out that saving faith encompasses within it the idea of repentance and the action of repenting. It's possible to repent and not, yet not to do it in faith. It's possible to repent and yet not do it in faith, but it is impossible to have faith and not repent. It's impossible not to believe in something that is diametrically opposed to where you're heading and what you've been believing and what you've been living for and not turn to it and not turn away from the thing that you've been living for and believing in and trusting in. A person can repent and not have faith, but he can't have faith without repenting. An example of that would be Judas. Judas betrayed the Lord Jesus, and then after he betrayed the Lord Jesus, we read that Judas repented. He was deeply remorseful for what he had done. He took the prop that he made and he cast it before the Sanhedrin and wouldn't receive it. He declared to him, I have, I have betrayed innocent blood. And then, because he didn't have faith in his repentance, he went out and hung himself. There wasn't a turn towards God. There wasn't a, it wasn't a, a repentance that was born out from him because of faith or hope or trust in something that God was going to provide for him. It was just a lament or a deep, for profound regret. It was a sentence against himself, but it wasn't a sentence of hope. It wasn't an act of faith. But then there was Peter. And Peter thought that he had betrayed the Lord Jesus as well, and he went out when he denied Christ three times, and he wept deeply, but in his weeping and in his brokenness, brokenness he, there must have been something in Peter that was turning in faith towards God. A belief, according to the words that Jesus himself had taught, that God had come to rescue and deliver not the righteous, but sinners and to grant them the kingdom, and to forgive them. And so, when Peter heard that the grave was empty, and that Jesus' body was not there, and that there was a word that he had risen from the de dead, Peter ran to that gravesite, and Peter ultimately met the Lord Jesus, and received from the Lord Jesus the full expression of his forgiveness, because his repentance was a repentance of faith. True faith always produces a repentance that turns from sin to lay hold of the object of its faith. And so John's message calling people to repentance was really a message calling for faith. It was a repentance produced by faith. They turn from and they turn to. When, when you became a Christian or if you become a Christian or when a person becomes a Christian, they only can do that by way of repentance and faith or I should say by way of a faith that repents. And then we begin living the Christian life in that exact same way. That faith that made us turn from our sin and our selfishness and our own efforts to save ourselves to Christ keeps us turning from sin and selfishness and our own effort to prove ourselves to Christ so that we're constantly turning to him. And so in reality, a Christian is not only a believer, a Christian is a repenter too because that's the kind of belief they have. 
a belief that compels them to turn away from themselves and turn to God. In verse 5 of our passage, what we have here is a description of what that kind of faith looks like like as it expresses itself in repentance. It's faith through the eyes of repentance that we see here. And we'll see that the very thing that's being called upon, the very thing that their people are being asked to do in repentance is beyond them. And yet they're to exercise themselves in this, in this act, in this act of repentance, because they believe that there's an answer from God for their sins. And so let's look at this wonderful picture, this word picture. It says there, every valley shall be filled and every mountain and hill brought low, and the crooked places shall be made straight, and the rough places or ways made smooth, and then all flesh shall see the salvation of God. It's, as we said, a wonderful word picture of faith producing repentance. It's a wonderful word picture also of the salvation that the Lord Jesus brings to those who believe in him and turn to him. And when we trust in that salvation, we are able to repent And as we repent, we demonstrate that we've trusted in that salvation. We're believing the Lord for that salvation. Let me explain this to you. The first thing we see here are things that, I think these are four things to be believed, but in the believing, there are four things to be repented of. And let's talk about the things to be repented of first. Here's what we see. First, we're to repent of, where it says, every valley shall be filled. What are we to, we're to repent of sin. The sin that has somehow cut deep grooves in our lives. The people of John's day knew what deep valleys were like. Jerusalem stood 2,600 feet above sea level. And from there, the people would make their way down. We're told that the people began to make their way. All of Jerusalem and Judea began to make their way down to the Jordan where John was preaching. And so they would have been descending further and further and further down into the great chasm or the great valley that lay below Jerusalem. And as they moved down, they would go all the way down to the Jordan River, which was another 600 feet below sea level where they would see John. And then from that point, they could know that that Jordan River would flow down to another 1,300 feet below sea level before it hit the Dead Sea. So the people knew something of this, 4,000 feet below Jerusalem. So as the people were going out to hear John in Jerusalem, they were consciously aware, all the way down to the Jordan, that they were going down, down, down to the Jordan to hear a message. And when they arrived where John was, he confronted them with their sins. And he told them of the deep, dark valley of their sin. And he told them that that sin had to be filled up. They had to repent, and they had to begin filling up the valley of sin in their life. There are in all of our lives dark depths of selfishness and pursuits for for personal domination and deceit and lust and covetousness and pride, and all these things run through our life as a current uh, that just continues through our life, and it cuts deep grooves through our life, and it cuts deep valleys through our lives. Sin gouges out our heart, deep valleys, and in those valleys we hide away ongoing sin. For us to be delivered from those sins, they have to be confessed, and they have to be turned from, and There's something impossible that is being asked by John when he speaks to the people. He's telling them that this act of repentance has to be to such an extent that they have to believe that the deep, profound grooves and valleys of sin in their life could be filled up. And and not simply believe it in some little way, but completely filled up so they don't exist anymore. And, And oddly enough, when these people were coming down to meet and hear John speak and we're entering into the water of baptism representing the fact that they were wanting to repent, there was within them this hope that came in their heart when they were giving this impossible message. The hope that these grooves and these great craters of sin in their life could be filled up. Somehow there could be an answer for the despondency and hopelessness of sin that was running deep in their own souls. John was saying, listen, there's a day of salvation arriving. There's a king that's coming, and he's coming to present and show to you his deep salvation. He's coming to do this great work in your life, and now fill up that valley. Fill up that valley of sin. You fill up that valley, you turn from that sin, you turn from that sense of deep and hopeless bondage, you fill it up and get ready, for the king is coming to save you. The people said, how do we do that? How do we begin to fill up this valley of sin? Look what John goes on to say to them in verses 10 through 14 of this passage. The crowds asked, what shall we then do? He answered them, whoever has two tunics is to share with him who has none, and whoever has food is to do likewise. And the tax collectors came to be baptized and said to him, teacher, what shall we do? 
And he said to them, collect no more than you're able to authorize to do. And soldiers asked him, what are we supposed to do? And he said to them, do not extort money from anyone by threats or by false accusation. And be content with your wages. And they began to, can you imagine? They're like little pebbles, the deep grooves and chasm of sin in their life. And they're being told, well, just do this. Just give a person a tunic for you. If, he, if you have two and somebody asks for a tunic, give them one of your tunics and if somebody is, don't, as a soldier, don't defraud anyone anymore and don't oppress anybody. And if you're a tax collector, don't collect more than what you're given the right to collect, which is how they made their living, by the way, was collecting a little more, it was on the edges. Don't do those things. Well, that's a rather small effort to make. That's like throwing a few pebbles into these great valleys that they've grooved out in their life. And yet they're to believe that somehow in this act of turning and hopefulness for the come of the king that that valley that valley is going to be filled up. Here's an application for you. Don't be overwhelmed by the command just yet. Just remember this part for now. Repentance is a call to action. It is a believing action that trusts that the valleys of sin can be filled up and leveled off in your life. It speaks to a change of mind and heart. It, it rouses the spirit to get vigorous and to move from their present condition. Paul speaks about the repentance of the people in Corinth and he, he said that their action of repentance was met with a vehement desire. They were passionate to acquit themselves, he says, in their repentance. They, they in a sense, got active even as they wanted to address and have God deal with their sin. Here it says, fill up the valley of sin. When a person turns to the Lord Jesus, their tears and their turning away from their sin and their desire now to follow him and live for them become like stones that they hurl, hurl into that valley. And somehow confidence to believe that God in a way will answer it and there will be, that valley can be filled up. And the, the thing that we would say to this, and I know it's true, is this is a futile act. <laughs> the valley of sin, in your, if, if you only knew, most people don't realize this. The depth of sin in your life is so great and so profound that you are not going to be able to fill it up by just doing a few good deeds. You're not going to fill it up even by changing the behavior that you've done in the past. You can't throw in a few coins of your own tears and that valley will be filled up. It's a futile act and yet, agreeing with you, John still says, believe in the impossible and rouse yourself to the task regardless. What could we find in scripture as a parallel to this? A lame man is brought on a pallet by his friends. They find out that the Lord Jesus is in a home and he's teaching there and they try to bring the man into the home but they can't get into the home and so they find a way to get on the roof and they bring the man on the pallet onto the roof and they peel back the tiles of the roof and they lower the Lord, this man down in the presence of the Lord Jesus. The Lord Jesus says to him, your sins have been forgiven you. And then the Lord Jesus says to this lame man, uh, arise, get up, take up your bed and walk home. I can't do that, that's why I've come here. That's why I've arrived here, it's impossible. But the man in faith, believing in the command that God has given him, turns from the perspective of his life that he's powerless and without health and without ability, begins to believe that that's exactly what he can do and what he will do and he obeys. And it's in the act of obedience that the impossible happens. The dark valley of sin spoken of by John and other passages of scripture are compared to chains that enslave us and bind us. And the truth is that we cannot even turn from one single sin in our life unless the Lord Jesus delivers us from us. We can't deliver ourselves from the bondage of sin unless Jesus speaks the word and the chains fall off and we're set free. And, but our act of faith is to in some sense, in some way still, turn from these things and believe in the turning in the repenting, that there is one who has an answer for the deep valley and deep grooves that sin has cut in our life who can fill them us as we turn to him. So we turn to him. It's an act of faith. Here's another thing it says here. Not only turning from our sins, it says every mountain and hill shall be brought low. Now, just in case you think to yourself, well, that's easy. I don't really have that many sins in my life. I could fill this up really easily. I could take care of this. In fact, I have such a resume of, of moral uh, uh, rectitude, you know, of, of, of being in a position of a high moral standing. And I, I'm so disciplined, and I'm so good, and I'm so committed, and I'm better that I can, I can handle this. Well, that's your next problem. Somehow you think that you can fill up that valley of sin by your efforts and your good works and your good deeds, by your moral powers. And by such an action, you can build a righteousness for yourself that will thrill the heart of God so that he'll accept you. Then this second word is for you. It's a word against your pride. 
If the valleys of sin impede God's way into our lives and impede the, the, the movement of his salvation upon our lives, more so do the mountains of pride. Look at Luke 18, verses 9 through 14. You, you keep your fingers in Luke 3, but let's go to Luke 18 for a moment. Here we have a description of the valley of pride in a certain individual. Luke 18, verses 9 through 14. Jesus spoke this parable, and he spoke this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee, the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus within himself, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I possess. The tax collector standing afar off would not so much as raise his eyes to heaven, but he beat his breast saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. It's the pride of the Pharisee that led him to pray, God, I thank you that I'm not like this tax collector, this publican. Any person who thinks that somehow there's something within them that enables them to become good enough to gain the favor of God, any person that thinks that they can be good enough in their own moral standing and their own moral effort or that their moral standing and their moral effort is what is needed to contribute to their salvation from God, good enough to make it into heaven by their own prayers or by their own performance, anyone like that also knows that there are individuals who don't and aren't good enough to gain heaven. Anyone who calculates, I think I've got it. I think I've managed my life well enough. I think I've done enough good deeds. I think I've been faithful enough to God that I'll get to heaven. And I've been dedicated enough that I'll get to heaven. Anyone who has any inkling of or any idea of that in their religion or in their efforts also has to think somehow back to there are people that don't. They don't know where the line is. The line may be at murderers. The line may be at mass murderers. The line may be at thieves. The line may be at gossips. They don't know exactly who it is. It might be just be a terribly low, lazy people and people who cause harm to others by their prejudices or whatever it is. Only what they're thinking actually by saying that, whether they say it or not, is they're, they're, actually, they're actually saying something like the Pharisee is saying. God, I just thank you that I'm not like that person. I thank you that I haven't gone that far over the edge. I'm on this side of the line and I'm going to make it. And God says that kind of person will not be justified. And also, as Christians, we would never dare to say, if we put our faith in Jesus Christ, we'd never dare to say that we could earn salvation from God, but at the same time, once believing that we've received salvation from, by, from God by faith, we somehow convince ourselves that we gain God's favor, and we gain God's acceptance, and we gain God's approval by all the good things that we do, and so we're still trying to somehow ingratiate ourselves to God by our own efforts and we don't understand that in and of ourselves all of our activity all of our efforts all of our labor are still as filthy rags it's only what Jesus Christ produces in us by faith as we submit to ourselves ourselves to him and surrender to him and seek to obey him in his power and through his life and we receive from him what we cannot produce in ourselves that that what we do is of honor and brings honor and glory to his name Repentance turns every turns to level the mountain of pride by beating our breast in brokenness and humility. Repentance goes on saying, the sum of what I am in my own self always deserves your judgment, but oh God, be merciful to me, the sinner. Oh Jesus, come and bring your life and your power in me. Pride, I think, at least for myself, so maybe I'm just speaking myself, but I think this is probably true of you as well. Pride is the most resilient expression of self that there is. And it's the Christian's duty to always keep it in the dust. We are called to believe that God can, through our faith, move mountains. And the first mountain that God wants to move through our faith is self-pride. Trust and a confidence and a belief in ourself. Some idea that we can accomplish and measure up to some standard God has for us by our own efforts. No, we're to die those things. We're to seek that God might help us to move that mountain. And by the way, again, this is an impossibility. <laughs> Filling up the valley of our sin is impossible. 
Tearing down the mountain of our pride is impossible. So even in these acts where we begin to deal with and beat our chest and turn away from our own pride, we have to believe that there's an answer to this effort or this movement that we make is, that is not in ourselves. Someone who is greater than our sin, who can fill it up. Someone who can level the self-exalting manner of our life and bring us and humble us before him. And there is. We'll talk about that in just a moment. The next thing it says is every crooked way has to be made straight. And what could this be? Well, I think the crooked way is the convoluted, self-justifying, self-preserving, self-defending, self-vindicating thinking that is constantly roiling around in our minds. Our minds are always addressing things bent and crooked. They're always double dealing in our thinking, always finding the doubt in order to cover the things that we want to do and how we want to live. We're always trying to find ways to get through life with less and less dependence upon God, being more and more independent to ourselves, controlling the outcomes for ourselves, exalting ourselves. Self doesn't want to die. Self doesn't want to relinquish its role of lording or being king. Self wants favor and praise for self. Self wants excuses and reasons for why it is the way that it is so it can justify itself. We'll hold on to certain laws and certain rules and we'll give ourselves to those things in order to a sense say that we've done it, that we've accomplished it, that we've commended ourselves to others and before God. We'll endlessly be turning around in our minds ways in which we could defend ourselves when we fail. I can do this. Give me one more chance. It was just this occasion. It was just this thing that messed me up. If you'd just straighten me out this way, God, if you hadn't brought that person in my life, there are all the things that our mind is constantly roiling through to defend itself and not turn in complete dependence upon God. We take the gospel that we hear and we twist the gospel of free salvation in Jesus Christ as a means to give us freedom to sin and pursue our own way of living and to live for our own self instead of live for Christ. We can be overcome with defeating thoughts that drive us away from God's way of truth and freedom as we submit and yield ourselves to him. We twist the word of God to satisfy our own itching ears to satisfy some minor craving for assurance or comfort or to fulfill some covetous desire in our life. And then added to all of our own fleshly propensities to think of and navigate our world, justifying ourselves and supporting ourselves and and somehow coddling our own self-interest, Satan comes along as well and he's constantly adding in convoluted ways of thinking, filling us with doubt, telling us to bow to this thing, telling us to question God, telling us that we're being denied some right, agitating the points of irritation where we haven't yielded our rights to God to say you don't have, no one has to deal with you that way and on and on and on and then added to all that, we have a world that's constantly whispering into our minds, a prescription for life that is contrary to the will of God and the way of God. All of these things happen to us. All of this comes upon us. Healthy ways of thinking, biblical ways of thinking can be twisted by the pressures as well of past experiences that we've gone through, of hurts that we've experienced, and by the pressure of living in a community that has developed a whole system of human identity that's not based on the truth of God and all these things press in upon us and our thinking is convoluted, convoluted. Such a challenge when you go into a society and the gospel is first opening up in that, deci- that, that, that society and they respond to the gospel, but then they, they have to go back and live in that society that has not had the bearing weight of the light of God's truth upon it. And uh, they're constantly being pulled back into the assumptions of darkness. And it's not only true in those places, it's true in our lives as well. The point is that our way of thinking is oftentimes perverted by the pressures of our own flesh and by the world we live in and the experiences we've gone through and by the devil himself. So what's to be confessed here? What is to be made straight? It's this. You say something like this. God, I like wisdom. My thinking is so convoluted and twisted by my own sinful tendencies to self-satisfaction and self-justification. I have been so turned around by my past by the age I've lived in and the devil is constantly around whispering in my ear, I've confessed to you, O God, that I I can't even think straight. And in that confession, a step is made in the right direction to straighten out the crooked ways of your life. A, A belief is beginning to form in you that's encouraged by the words of John that says that the crooked things can be made 
straight and that God can come and renew your mind to think those things that are true and right after him. And again, in just a moment, we'll talk about how God answers that. That's, that's almost an impossible thing to think, that you can unthink the things that you constantly, regularly, without even thought, think. But God can do that too. God, I want to think differently. I want to have a different mind about myself. And I turn from these things, and I, I don't give myself that to think in the old patterns that I've thought before. I want to turn from these crooked things, and God can do that for you. Here's the last one. It says, the rough places shall be made plain or smooth, and this actually seems much smaller than filling up a valley and much smaller than actually removing a mountain, <clears throat> maybe even easier than uh, straightening out a crooked path, and yet I think this may be the one that we least believe God for of all of these things. As evangelicals, we've been led to believe God can forgive me of all my sins, and God can put his life in me and transform me, and God's word is a light to my feet and a lamp to my path, but you know, I've got these habits. I got these rough things in my life that I was born with. I'm just like my dad, I'm just like my mom, it's just you know, the, the, the temperament of my culture, it's just the way my people are, and I've always been impatient, I just can't, you know, I just can't abide with fools, or whatever it is. And deep down inside, we have a hard time believing that God could make us into a different person that we have developed as the pattern of behavior in our lives. We may be rude, we can be poor listeners, we can be impatient or pushy or irritable, we fly off the handle when someone cuts us off, or we may be overeaters, we may tend to be thankless, we may have just kind of a deep, established insecurity in our life, or pessimism in our life, or a neediness in our life, or a, a central weakness in our life that we've just decided is just the way we're going to be. And the other one is, you might have all those things, or some of those things, and be completely unaware of them. Just everybody else who talks about you when you're not around is. God's given us a Bible full of passages that command us away from these rough ways that tell us where God wants to smooth us out so the road is not rough for him to come and bring his salvation, present and work his salvation in our lives. And if you don't know about those passages, but you've grown up in a home where your mother or your wife knows those passages, you've heard them. Right? They've shared them with you. How many times did our parents sit us down and read us some, some word from the Proverbs to address some area of your life? How many times has someone had read to them James 1.19? Let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, and slow to wrath. And there's all kinds of passages like that. Warning against being crude or lazy or not providing for your family or being unkind or not being thoughtful or not being clean, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. They go on. We are most prone to give these rough places in our life the pass. Oh, God, well, I want you to deal with those deep, grooved sins in my life. And, oh, God, I, I even want you to deal with the pride in my life. I don't want to trust in myself or my salvation. And, and oh, God, I, I do want you to help me think differently. I want your truth. But, you know, these things, well, they're, they're just always going to be around. They're, they're who I am. Maybe because deep down inside we think that it's impossible for these points to bring, be, that change can be brought to these points in our life. That these are the most pernicious, th pernicious things, the things that hold on to us, actually the things that define us the most. That these two we must believingly repent of. We must believe that God can smooth out these areas in our life. We must believe that God can take these very things and work in us so profoundly that they'll be unrecognizable by a generation that might come towards the end of our life or as God has worked through those areas in our life. And all of a sudden, they'll start, there'll be a generation that rises up that didn't know our past, somebody who hasn't, you know, in the past read all those statements to us, and they've never heard about our bad habits, and they might say just the opposite of what was said of us before. We have to believe that God can do that in our life. Well, here's our application. Valleys of sin, mountains of self and pride, crooked ways of self-justification and self-vindicating th thought, rough ways of coarseness. These reveal the very places where King Jesus has come to address our lives. His salvation was meant to come and impact us in all these places. Hold on to them, don't turn for them, and they become obstacles that keep you from the King's saving work. 
our sin, our pride, our prejudices, our crude selfishness can inhibit. If we don't turn from them, and faith, believing that God can deliver us from these things, will keep us from the salvation he wants to bring to us. And they don't, by the way, when we don't turn from this thing, it doesn't just impact us. When we turn from these things, we not only create a highway through which God can continue to bring his salvation to us. That's how it initiates. First, God brings his his salvation to me because I I recognize that all these things are a portrait and picture of my brokenness and my separation from the God of life. And I turn from them. God, I I turn from all these things. I don't know if I want to give a self-example of this, but I will for just a moment. I believe that the thing that really held me as a young man was a pharisaical pride. And a day came when God revealed to me the awful awful sinfulness of my pride. And what rose to my heart was a word of repentance. It was, oh God, I don't want to be Joel Van Hoogen anymore. I don't want to be that person at all. That's repentance. But the very cry also was a cry that said, oh God, I believe you. That you can do exactly that. That you can totally transform my identity. That might be so wrapped up in you that it would be God and it would be Christ in me and not myself. So we have to address these things. And the person who truly repents, believingly repents, repents with the belief that God can ultimately deal with all these things in your life. In fact, that's what a salvation does. It takes away my sin and it covers it up and it it removes and dismantles my pride and it, it comes and it begins to give me a mind that can think the right things and have a clear understanding of God's will and God's way and it, it begins to smooth out my life so that God can, by the way, when that happens and we have that attitude, we, the road just maintains an openness so God can continue to come and minister to us over and over again the development and expression of that salvation as it expands and grows in our life. That's what sanctification is. And actually, when you live in that way, that kind of believing, repenting life, what happens is your life not only becomes a roadway through which God can bring his work in your life, but it becomes a a roadway through which God can work in the lives of others. Speak these truths and promise these hopes and give these words of hope and promise to others. This is the way of a believing repenter. But, again, I'll just point out to you, you're believing in the impossible. Because you can't fill up the valley of your sin. You can't tear down the mountain of your pride. You can't somehow transform your mind to think the right thoughts all by yourself. And you certainly can't, you certainly can't knock off the rough edges of your life just by your own effort. God has to do all these things. God works all these things. And yet this is exactly what God has promised us, right? God has promised us that when we believe in Jesus Christ and receive him as our Savior, that at that very moment he washes and forgives us of all of our sin. He breaks all of the chains so they have no bondage over us and they have no claim on us. He gives us a transforming life so that if anyone is a Christ, he's a new creature, old things have passed away and everything has become new. And he, he fills in that valley completely with his own life and his own goodness and his own righteousness. And the Bible also teaches us that when we have this kind of faith that Christ comes, the king comes and lives in us, but the king expresses himself in that humble act of coming to live in our heart Realize that when Jesus comes to live in your heart and dwell in you by faith, that he is actually coming in a humble act to occupy your life and he begins to live that humility out from you so that he exalts himself and he glorifies himself and he sets down and he, through his work and through his power, he allows you to put to death through the Holy Spirit all the things that are done in your own flesh and all your own self-interest. He allows you to fulfill the desire, and he actually puts a desire in your heart that John the Baptist had. John said, I I must decrease, and he must increase. So he brings to us, and he produces in us a humility, a wonderful and profound humility. And in the same way, he renews our minds. As I believe and trust in the Lord Jesus, he begins to bring a renewing to my mind and my thoughts. So in 1 John 2, verse 27, John tells us that when a person receives Christ, he receives an anointing from God in which they are given wisdom from God. Here, let me read to you verse 27. 1 John 2. To the believer who has received Christ as Savior, but the anointing you have received from him abides in you, and you do not need that anyone should teach you, but as the same anointing teaches you concerning all things, and is true, and is not a lie, and just as it has taught you, you shall abide in him. <laughs> God begins by his Holy Spirit to give you an understanding and a wisdom that helps you recognize the lies that you've surrounded in your life and to recognize the truth, and that anointing comes to you from God. 
Paul says in Romans 12, 3, that what it is, it's the renewing or transforming of your mind. He does it in our lives. He gives that to it. He works that in our lives. Paul also says that Christ is made in saving us. Christ has made to us a number of things. But one of the things he says Christ has made to us is wisdom. Christ has made to us wisdom. James tells us that if we lack wisdom, we can ask of God and he'll give it to us and he won't scold us that we didn't have it before. He gives us wisdom. It's one of the great promises of our salvation. Christ gives us wisdom. He begins to unravel the convoluted thought of our minds so that we think differently than what's put into us and stamped in upon us by our age. And then also the rough places he begins to smooth out. I believe all those verses in the New Testament where you have commands against crude language that you should use or not stealing or not being lazy or working and all those things. I don't believe that it's just a bunch of proverbial prescriptions saying these are the things if you're a Christian you have to do. I think what it's saying is as a Christian these are the things God wants to do in you. These are the very areas that God wants to and God is ready and working and if you'll believe me addressing your life right now. He wants to make your your mouth, a mouth that when it opens up speaks words only of edification to people. He wants to work in your life in such a way that, to, that you don't defraud people with false promises where you're just promoting yourself before them to get the advantage over them. And he wants to do all these things in your life and he can and he does. It's a promise. It's a picture. It's a portrait of Christ and how Christ wants to live his life out from us making the rough places smooth and it all becomes ours. It all becomes ours when we believe in him. Some years ago, I shared this illustration with you. It was a missionary who had gone to visit a little mountain town in Ecuador, and when he entered into this little village or town, it was this poor, filthy, dirty, dark, oppressed little village, and he spent a short period of time there as he was passing through, and he left without giving them much of a word or being able to communicate with them much truth at all, but he, he forgot one of the suitcases that he was carrying in that village. And that village found the suitcase, held it for a certain while, thinking he might return, but he didn't, so they opened it up, and inside of it, they found that it was full of tracts, gospel tracts, written in their language. They began to study them and read them, and a number of the individuals in that village, in fact, a significant number of the people in that village came to Christ. Years later, that missionary returned to find that same village clean and vibrant and productive and changed. Why? Because God does miracles. God does the impossible when we believe in him and trust in him. And so as God does this work in our lives, he not only makes a way to graciously express his salvation to us and in us, but he also begins to express his salvation through us to others. So that, and this is the last words in what we've been reading here in Luke chapter 3, so that all flesh can behold in me. All flesh can behold in you the salvation of the Lord. Even so, Lord Jesus, do that in my life. Let's bow our heads. Here there must be an agreement. We must continue to grow where you found us. We must continue to exercise faith in the promises where you met us. You showed us our sin. We wanted to turn from our sins, but we turned from them believing, O oh God, that you could take our sins away. We who trusted in ourselves turned from ourselves, believing, O oh God, that you had an answer that was beyond us and that all life and all hope was in you and you alone. And by faith, O oh God, we recognize that all the lies we believed before were false and untrue and we decided not to listen to them but to listen to you. And we even saw all the pettiness of our life, the residue of the sin, the bad thinking, the pride, the sin that was just somehow continuing to rough up our lives. And we, we wanted in that moment of your forgiveness and your cleansing and your renewing, we wanted these things to be changed as well. And oh God, we keep turning to you for these things. We keep trusting in you for these things. We thank you for the initial answer. We thank you for freedom in Christ and forgiveness and cleansing. We thank you that Christ has been exalted in us as Savior. We thank you, oh God, that you've worked in us, renewing our minds and teaching us wisdom, and your word has come alive to us by the power of your Holy Spirit. Oh, keep us from ever trusting in the arm of the flesh. Keep us always coming back to you for these things again and again so that more and more and more of your saving power might be expressed to us and expressed through us. Our great hope in our great Savior.